You have the right to remain silent. Walter White, you have the right to remain silent. The Miranda rights, we've all heard them. But what really happens to regular people after they're arrested? You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you at no cost. Mm, that's nice. If you can't afford one, they'll provide you an attorney. And if you're a TV show character, you'll meet with that attorney as soon as you get to the police station. But if you can't afford an attorney in real life, you're probably going to sit in jail for many days before you see one. No one wants to be arrested, but it happens. Unfortunately, right now, it's happening to me. Spoiler alert, I'm innocent and I cannot afford an attorney, which means I'm about to spend a long time in jail. I have no idea what happens to someone after they're arrested in the state of California or when I'll get to see a lawyer. So I'm turning to the experts. The Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center has some great reports, including grading and justice, initial appearance report cards. I read the report, but I'm really in trouble. So I took it a step further and contacted the authors of the report directly. I'm Malia Brink. Um, I am a senior policy attorney with the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center, um, which is at housed at SMU Law School. My name is Jia Chen Yu. I am a policy attorney also at the Decent Center at SMU Law School. And prior to working as a policy attorney, I was a state level public defender in Massachusetts and Texas. The issue is often, when which is the initial occurrence crisis, is that often you don't get to see a judge right away. We watch a lot of TV dramas where uh, you get arrested and immediately the next screenshot's over, you are seeing a judge and there's an attorney standing next to you saying, my client should go home, not a flight risk. That sometimes doesn't happen for about a week or even longer. So you're just sitting in jail in that time, especially if you are poor and don't have a lawyer, can't afford your own lawyer, can't afford any kind of money to get yourself out. You're just sitting there. Um, and at the same time, the world is still moving around you. Your kids are uh, have no one to be pick, no one's picking your kids up from daycare. No one's going to job to tell your supervisor that you're being arrested, so you may lose your job. Uh, if it's uh, if might you might be missing rent, so you get you might be getting evicted or getting fined by your landlord. There are just so many collateral consequences to that initial appearance delay, just from the simple act of not being able to see a judge for a long period of time. There's really nothing um, in the Constitution that says this is how soon after arrest you have to be brought brought to court. There's nothing um, largely because of a, of a case decided in the early aughts called Rothbury that says exactly when a lawyer must be assigned to you. There's nothing that says this is how quickly you have to have a hearing to determine whether you can continue to be held pretrial. What does initial appearance look like across the country. Um, as you can see, this is our map of how the different jurisdictions laws uh, came out in that um, comparison to those five best legal practices. Um, lots of Fs, lots of Ds, couple Cs. There's only one jurisdiction that gets close and that's Maryland. Often, um, they're at 48 or 72 hours, and those time frames typically exclude weekends and holidays. Um, so you can see, like, um, you know, if you were arrested on a Friday and you were going into a long weekend, even if you're in a 48-hour state, that 48 hours is going to very quickly become closer to four days. Um, uh, lots of jurisdictions do not have weekend court um, or holiday court. Um, jurisdictions that have a 24-hour guarantee, they have judicial sessions that are being held on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays, um, usually on a rotation system. So that's sort of the national picture. So this is California's initial appearance report card. It's very common in California um, that um, there are 
not there's not weekend court. Um, so a lot, you know, most people who are being arrested Friday, right, they're sitting through Monday. And if that Monday is a holiday, they're sitting even longer. Um, there's no guarantee of counsel at initial appearance in California. So even once you have that appearance, you may be unrepresented. Um, there's no guarantee that defense counsel is going to be appointed uh, quickly to start investigating your case. There's no protection if that 48 hours gets extended. If somehow, I don't know, the jail uh, data is wrong, nobody brings you to court, um, it could go much longer and there's no real um, accountability measure. So California is one of our F states um, on initial appearance. So now I'm thinking, what if? What if I could afford a lawyer? How would my situation be different? Hmm. Okay, well, so far it seems to be exactly the same. Still getting arrested. Still getting booked at a police department somewhere in California. And still having to call my family and break the news to them that I got arrested. But this is the part where everything changes because now I can ask my family to get me a lawyer. And because we have the money, we can afford to get an attorney for me right away. That is what will change everything because her calling an attorney for me means that the day I'm arrested, someone is already working on my case. Instead of sitting pointlessly for days in jail, I've got someone trying to get me out from day one. And that person is not only on my side, they're finding out about my case. They're finding out about my background, my life. All of a sudden, I've got a defense attorney putting a whole team on my case, including an investigator who finds out that the search on my friend's car that I borrowed wasn't even legal. This really shifts things because now my attorney's in a position to call the DA's office. Guess what? The district attorney agrees to review my case. And when she does, she decides she doesn't even want to file charges against me. Can you believe it? My attorney is getting me out of jail and this won't even go on my permanent record. I'm going to be free. I couldn't believe it until it really happened, until I really got out. I'm so thankful to my attorney. I'm so happy. I can't believe this is real. And I shouldn't believe this is real. Because it isn't. While California does have a failing grade on initial appearance, um, there are also a number of good things afoot in California that people should be aware of. So for example, there are a number of jurisdictions in California that have actually groundbreaking in initial appearance practices um, that are worthy of um, being replicated across the country. My name is Alicia Hall. I am the Associate Director of the Research Practice Strategies Department at the Center for Justice Innovation, formerly known as the Center for Court Innovation. The team that I'm on um, here at the Center for Justice Innovation is a really interesting team within the center because it's a combination of practitioners and researchers. So myself and my colleague are attorneys um, who have practiced in various ways. So I'm a former prosecutor. My colleague is a former defense attorney. And so we bring our experience in the criminal legal system into the work that we do to be able to support jurisdictions as they're thinking through what innovations could look like, what reforms could look like in their county. Um, and we partner with researchers in our department as well who have studied you know, criminology, criminal justice work, criminal justice reform work uh, to be able to help us 
look at what the research says about what's happening in the criminal legal system, the different innovations and their impacts on the criminal legal system and the folks who are going through it. Um, and what we do is translate that research in a way that makes it applicable to the jurisdictions who wanna to try to implement it. So we've been working with the Santa Barbara Public Defender's Office um, through a project um, with the Bureau for Justice Assistance and Arnold Ventures um, to help design a plan for what early access to counsel could look like within the county. Um, a really, really important issue. Um, there's plenty of research out there that shows the positive impact of having individuals who are going through the criminal legal system uh, connected with attorneys as early as possible. Um, this early connection would allow folks to uh, be able to have their cases investigated earlier, um, to identify any mental health or substance use issues um, that could require services or supports at an earlier stage um, and having attorneys present at the arraignment, which already happens with Santa Barbara County, um, which is great because it doesn't happen in all counties uh, throughout the country, you know, also can impact pre-trial release decisions as well. And so it's a really, really important initiative for the county being led by the public defender's office to ensure that they can connect with their clients earlier um, in hopes that they can sort of impact what happens after that. Well, my name is Jill Sharkey and I'm a professor in the Department of Counseling, Clinical and School Psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And, you know, we want to see um, less criminal activity and we want people to be thriving in our community. And so um, this, but if we take people who've done some harm in the community and put them in jail, they're not going to, their life's not going to improve and their uh, way about going in the community is not going to improve. And so if we can kind of catch people and provide them services to address their needs, um, then we can hope that they will stay out of trouble and be doing better and not be in the jail, which is also costly and um, ineffective. So I think it's gonna benefit the clients, it's gonna be benefit the providers because they're gonna feel better about what they're doing. And it's gonna benefit our community because we'll help less crime and more healthy people. My name is Lamare Kyle Griffiths. I am the Assistant Public Defender for the Santa Barbara County Public Defender's Office. There are several times, due to any number of reasons, that somebody gets charged with something they're not guilty of. They get charged with something that that gets overcharged for various reasons, um, or they get charged with something they didn't really have the intent to do or the ability to even form what they call criminal intent to do based on how their mind functions, based on the situation they're in. A lot of times this does get found out, but it gets found out days later, weeks later, sometimes months later. And part of the reason for that is evidence gets destroyed, People don't have the ability to share witnesses or talk to family members who would be able to give us that information. And people can't even gather records and things like that. Um, this would allow all that to happen immediately. So we would be able to get that information, which could do a lot of things. It would help the DA, um, the district attorney, because we would be able to give them information and say, hey, before you even file this charge, you need to know this information, or you should know that, which means the filing decisions will be better and more accurate. And it means that there may be more charges that aren't filed immediately because we already know the information that we need to know. Um, it also means that people can be released right now Many judges will continue a case when it goes to that arraignment of that first appearance. They'll continue the case because they don't have verification of who this person is, where they live. And while we might say we believe that somebody is living with a mental health diagnosis or we believe they're in need of medication or we believe this, we don't have any verification. And it's difficult to do because you need releases of information to get records um, or to even talk to somebody's doctor. This way, we'd be able to get that information, talk to the person, get that release, get the information we need so that the judge also feels good about making a release decision or um, connecting somebody with a service as part of some kind of release plan. And then public safety improves. Instead of folks making guessing and either making decisions to release somebody who doesn't have the supports to make it back to court or to finish out and resolve their case or leaving somebody in jail because we aren't sure, we actually can release people with plans, with connections, and increase 
the safety of our community and of, and of the public. So it will mean so much for a lot of people um, and not even talking about the ripple effects that happen in families. My name is Tracy McCuga. I'm the Chief Defender of the Santa Barbara Public Defender's Office, but notably, I've been a public defender for 30 years and I celebrated 30 years this year. So I've been in the business for a very long time. Early representation is extremely important and it's important because it levels the playing field between the poor and the rich. By putting the public defender's office in the jail to, to meet with clients upon arrest is a game changer. So Mr. Michael Lowe um, was boarding a plane in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport back in 2021. And he was mistakenly identified as someone who stole from a shop at the DFW airport. The police said that, uh, talked to American Airlines, American Airlines says that this is the guy that stole from the shop. So the police went and got a warrant for him. Uh, a Texas warrant for him. Mr. Michael Lowe is from Arizona. So he went back to Arizona, none the wiser about um, having a warrant out of Texas. And a year later, he went on vacation in New Mexico and got arrested on that Texas warrant while he was in New Mexico. He spent eight days in jail without seeing a judge or a lawyer. And when he finally went in front of the judge after eight days, the judge couldn't really tell him anything about the Texas case. The judge just advised him, hey, you should uh, agree that you are the person that Texas is looking for and just waive your right to a hearing. So he, without any counsel, said, yes, judge, you know, I will do that. Because what are you going to do when someone on a bench is telling you you should do this. So the judge um, sent him back to jail. And he spent another nine days in jail without knowing what's going on in his case. And after 17 days, he was just released without further explanation. He got a lawyer in, da in Dallas, and the lawyer contacted the police, look at the videotape, could tell with like right away that he was not the guy who stole from that shop and all charges were dropped and which means you know he was completely innocent this whole time it is a completely bad luck for him that he got identified completely bad luck that he landed in new mexico now if he was arrested in arizona which does have 24-hour initial appearance he might have seen the judge a lot sooner but because he got arrested in more rural part of New Mexico, he, stuck in, he was stuck in jail for 17 days. He was pretty traumatized by that experience. He witnessed some violence at the jail. He was a small business owner that, um, and he lost thousands of dollars as a result of his incarceration. And now he's suing American Airlines for improperly identifying him as the person who stole from that shop. When we saw this case, what we think about is it shouldn't matter that he was in rural New Mexico. What the um, If the best practices for initial appearance were practiced throughout the country and consistently, he should have seen a lawyer right away. He should have seen a judge right away. And she should be able to get out right away without suffering all these extra um, collateral consequences for a completely mistaken arrest. Contra Costa County in Northern California has had tremendous success with its early representation program of four years, 
Holistic Intervention Partnership. My name is Jeffrey Robinson. I'm a client service specialist with the Contra Costa County Office of the Public Defender's Office. Uh, my program is called HIP, the Holistic Intervention Partnership. So the point of the program is to help people at the earliest point that they've contacted police or had contact with police to start mitigating those issues. That's the whole purpose of the program. I can link them with services anywhere. So hypothetically, they could have a case in Contra Costa County and I can link them with services in Santa Barbara if that's where they're physically located, which, you know, sometimes I have to do. You know, I've helped clients find a service in Oregon because that's where they're at. So they're not bound in, in Contra Costa County. My program is funded to uh, reduce recidivism, to uh, not just re reduce recidivism, but to reduce failures to appear and change people's lives around the things that are causing them to return to jail and to prison. That's what the program's funded for. If I were still back in my hometown of San Francisco, I'd also have had a better shot at seeing a lawyer right away. The city and county of San Francisco has made headlines and set the bar high with its progressive early representation program. Our Tricia Moore Jenkins, San Francisco Public Defender's Office. I am the lead for the pretrial release unit. My name is Lisa Afanasiev. I'm a deputy public defender also working in the pretrial release unit under the amazing Atricia Moore for the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. The pretrial release unit was started about five years ago by under the leadership of the amazing Jeff Adachi. The idea of it is to give folks um, early representation, early access to attorneys once they get arrested. The idea is that People are not lingering in custody, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what the next steps are, and not having access to an attorney. I've had cases prior to arraignment where I've been able to get information to um, the district attorney, and that information is um, taken into consideration when the charging DA is looking at whether or not charging the case as a felony or a misdemeanor or um um, discharging the case before arraignment. That early intervention, that early prepping of the cases is invaluable. Jacques, who Wilson describes it so accurately as a kidnapping, and that's what happens when a person is arrested. They are literally handcuffed, pulled up the street, and thrown in, into a cage. And no one knows that where they are for you know, you know, up to 24, 48, you know, many, a very long time. So, so it's what, what we do is really important. And, um, and yeah, and I'd like to see it continue and spread across the United States, because everyone is entitled to, to legal representation from the moment of arrest. At least that's the, it, there's a San Francisco ordinance. I don't, of course, that's not the law nationwide, but it should be. It absolutely should be. Because people with means are represented absolutely from the beginning. And that's just not, that's not, that's not, that's not justice. Justice is equality. It's not income-based. And here in this country, it's absolutely income-based. I know what you're thinking. You don't work in a public defender's office but there's still so much we can do as members of our community. People speak up every day about inequalities in our justice system for people of color, people with substance abuse issues, and people with mental illnesses. A quick Google search will find these organizations ready for you to join them. My name's Larry Severance. I um, am a board member of CLU, which is Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice in Santa Barbara. It's a nonprofit organization. We are an organization that brings together different faith communities that share common values and develop positions to advocate based on those values. The League of Women Voters has a parallel criminal justice uh, group, and we started working together. When you actually look at the research and actually 
study what works. Putting people in jail doesn't reduce crime in the in the general community. It actually leads to recidivism and increased crime. So actually, we will be safer with a lower jail population with community-based alternatives to help people sort out what their issues are than we are just saying, you know, you committed a crime, now you're going to be in jail. And so it, I, I'm not for a minute saying that um, violent people who uh, would be a threat to the public shouldn't be, we shouldn't be protected from those folks. But there's a lot going on that uh, um, is injustice. My name is Lynn Gibbs, and I'm uh, affiliated with um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I um, joined NAMI um, many years ago um, when my daughter um, was diagnosed with a mental illness. I also uh, serve as an advisor to Families Act. Mental illness is the only serious illness where people who are the most ill get the least treatment. Our loved ones can often wind up in the jail when in fact, if we had a treatment bed for them, that's where they they would go for stabilization. And then, you know, once they get to the jail, then they um, uh, it can become more difficult for them. Um, and they can wind up there for periods of time or return to the community in, uh, unfortunately, um, in worse shape than when they got to the jail. If they have lawyers and support and people who can get to them when they first reach the jail, then maybe they can be diverted at that very early stage into community-based treatment instead. Black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by the criminal legal system. Um, uh, and there is a strong correlation between folks who have touch points with the criminal legal system and folks who have substance use or mental, um, mental health concerns as well. And so programs like Early Access to Counsel are touching communities of color um, and will be serving those, uh, those communities. And that's really important. Um, we can't deny who is being impacted by the system most often. We also can't deny um, the fact that as we think about reform, and we think about putting reforms into place, um, the impact that it, the potential impact to marginalized communities is great, but there needs to be an intentionality there. If you had money when you were arrested for something, you would be able to reach out to an attorney, you'd be able to reach out to your doctor, you might be able to get your medications again. We hope to bring that, those privileges into those folks who are people of color, who are poor and who are struggling in our community, which will make all of us better. Nine days after my arrest, I finally get my freedom. And now I know, if I'd had access to an early representation program, this probably never would have happened to me. Walk down onto Figueroa Street, and you'll see men and women shackled in orange, as in the days of slavery, being paraded in Santa Barbara on our streets to go to a courtroom. You know, publicly, in a, in a humiliating way. There's an injustice in that in and of itself. And the most important thing, I think this is important, is the vast majority of people that are prosecuted in our entire country are from misdemeanors. And those misdemeanors impact their ability to get a job, impact their ability to get housing, impact their ability to get a, a student loan. And when I first came to Santa Barbara, every single day I would walk into a arraignment court and I would see a UCSB student in our courtroom who was arrested for a minor violation and their whole life in that fraction of a second, that, that maybe that bad choice or that bad decision that they made was going to change their career. And that's what the criminal justice system does. The most important thing you can do is be observers and be participants in the system. Um, I challenge each of you to go literally into a courtroom in our county and you will witness firsthand the inhumanity of the system. You will witness firsthand the injustice and you will feel palpably the fear of human beings caged, shackled, and brought into a courtroom that treats them as a defendant rather than as a human being. 
And the most important thing is that you have to realize whether you're at your church, your synagogue, temple, it doesn't matter where you are, you're at your store, there is somebody standing next to you whose, whose life has been impacted by the criminal justice system. Their child has been arrested, their nephew, their, their husband, someone has intersected with the criminal justice system and been negatively impacted by this. So getting involved, raising your hand, raising your fist to fight for justice matters. But seeing firsthand what's going on is the most important thing. And then voting, showing up at Board of Supervisor hearings, demanding that we treat people in the criminal justice system humanely is very important. Making this film has helped me find my social justice voice. So I went to a Board of Supervisors hearing. And when public forum came, I decided to stand up and speak to the board in favor of reducing the size of a jail in Santa Barbara County. We will now go to Love Maya to be followed by Susan Horn. Love? Thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Love. I am a senior at UC Santa Barbara, and I want to speak to you on behalf of myself and my friends as members of this community in support of option one. We learned through research in school last quarter that this county spends more on policing per capita than Los Angeles. Yet in my civic engagement class yesterday, we discussed the fact that there are only 16 beds in this county for people suffering from mental illnesses. All of us in that class are graduating from college next month and more prison cells is not the future that we want. It is wrong to essentially put people in cages for amounts of time not in line with our constitution when those people are presumed innocent and when so many were arrested for nonviolent offenses often committed due to mental illness or substance abuse issues. This is not where we want the money that we put into our community to go. We need to move in the direction of more humanity for each other as human beings, not less. 